it seemed like they were a little soft on the use of fossil fuels. It's kind of like, hey, doom and gloom, the world's going to come to an end. Like the world's going to be so terrible, but we'll just carbon capture capture everything. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And I feel like that was kind of a little bit of a cop out there. Welcome back, everyone, to another Fifth Wall Climate Tech vodcast where we discuss all things climate tech related and the new advancements there and also all things climate news related. Today, you've got Cedric and Christian with you, a little CNC. It's your climate boys. And we've released some episodes online and we're still here. So good news for our jobs. Today, we are going to jump into the IPCC report that was just recently released. And we're going to talk about what it is really quick, why it's important, and what is the future actually going to look like. But Cedric, why don't you just kick us off with the first part? What is the IPCC? What is, what is this report? Absolutely. So the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, is essentially a collection of governments and nations, you know, working together to come up with science-based and very objective reports and findings on, you know, climate change, where we are in the fight against climate change and the causes of it. They just released their, I believe, sixth annual report, and it was a pretty sobering report. I quote, human activities, principally through emissions of greenhouse gases, have unequivocally caused global warming, with global surface temperature reaching 1.1 degrees Celsius above 1815 to 1900 in 2011 to 2020. Basically, we're the cause of climate change. We are, you know, still net positive on our emissions. Um, We're still emitting more than we're reducing or capturing. And we need to do a lot more in in terms of fighting climate change. Got it. And so is this report just telling us, hey, we're all screwed? Or we is it presenting giving some, you know, solutions to the problem? Yeah. So the the first part of the report is pretty depressing, to be honest. You know, I was reading through it and I'm just like, why, why? Why am I here? What are we, where were you even trying? But in the, the second half of the report, you know, it gives more of a pot- positive spin on it, you know, it provides some solutions and, you know, here's what we need to do, some mitigation activities, some, you know, adaptation strategies that we can use and we need to pursue further. I think all in all, it kind of reinvigorates reinvigorates me and motivates me to, you know, this is why why we're waking up every day and coming to work to fight the good fight. Cedric, say like a true climate warrior. Um, no, that that's great. And and I'm happy to see reports like this, especially when they're raising a red flag on some of these issues to actually recommend some type of mitigation or solution. It's a huge pet peeve of mine when people in general come out and say, well, this is what's wrong with everything. And you're like, cool. What about a solution? Yeah. Like, let's actually talk about what's important here. So I'm glad that they are making some recommendations on that. Um, just another question to you. Why, why is this report important? In my view, it's, it's uh, you know, because it's a collection of, of governments all working together, you would hope that there's no agenda behind it other than presenting clear and, you know, tr- you know, objective facts um, on where we are in, in terms of climate change. It, you know, brings together the, the best minds um, and really puts, you know, quantitative facts to what we've been all talking about qualitatively. That's what I like about it, right? And why I think it's important is to have these really productive discussions. You've got to put the data out there and we've got to rip through that data. We've got to see what's legit, what's not. Um, and that's where the real conversations can happen. Otherwise, it's just, you know, kind of sharing your opinion or pontificating on some more theoretical aspects of what you're calling climate change, right? And so I appreciate that side. Anyone that's familiar with the IPCC report is going to know that it is a very extensive report. I mean, yeah, (laughs) it is very beefy. I doubt many people have read it cover to cover. Um, There are hundreds of pages out there. 
And so what we want to do here today is focus in on some of the more topics that are more relevant to us. So think of things around energy, think of things around the built world as well. Yeah, I think one of really TLDR visuals is, you know, the the sectoral emissions and pathway that limit warming to one and a half degrees Celsius. It has essentially four lines, land use change, energy supply, transport, industrials, and buildings, and then lastly, non-CO2 emissions. The table shows that you know land use change and, and energy supply is likely to get to net zero fastest. These are the two pathways. And this really emphasizes, at least to me, my takeaway was, yes, built world climate tech needs a lot more work, a lot more investment, and a lot more innovation. You know, it's just a harder harder problem to solve, um, you know, as we've been talking about and kind of what drives this underlying thesis of our fund is, you know, if we apply all the today's best of breeds technologies onto the building and switch to, you know, 100% renewable grid, we only get half of the way there to, to building net, uh, net zero. So this is kind of, you know, putting a, a double underline under why Fifth Wall is doing what we're doing. No, totally. And it, it just makes intuitive sense when you look at this graph, it especially it looks at, it says in land use change, right? It includes halting of deforestation. That's something you can do today. Right? There's a lot of platforms, technologies, companies that are working on just preventing deforestation today. Yeah. And that's something you can change immediately. Going into, I mean, look at the building and the structure that we're sitting in the amount of work that you'd have to go through, the approvals you'd need with the city, right, to decarbonize this building. I mean, the cement is here. It's just, right, you're not going to change that. So you'd have to do everything around the building systems, maybe additions to other parts of uh, the HVAC or, or the plumbing system for more resilient water use. That's just going to take a lot of time. That's really capital intensive. So those things are going to take you know, there's going to be a definite transition. So this, this all makes sense to me. And I think the transport is probably going to be the part that drives the most of the curve down, like the EV adoption. Like, I think that's so much higher than what we're going to see maybe in the real estate world, which is again, to why fifth wall exists to help drive that curve down. So the building sector is actually a significant portion of that. I partially agree with that. I think the, the transportation piece is going to uh, drive the most, you know, carbon reduction in the near term. But I think in kind of the the long tail of that, you know, call it from 2040 to 2050, I think it's the real, uh, the real change is going to come from, you know, industry, these hard to abate sectors um, and buildings, just given a, the size of their carbon footprints, and then just be the, the, the market opportunities there. Another uh, graphic or part of the report that stood out a lot to me was the one on renewable electricity generation is increasingly price competitive, and some sectors are electrifying. What has happened over the last decade is we've seen precipitous drops in the price of things like solar. I think solar was over an 86% drop in price. Batteries are dropping a ton to wind. You can include in that equation as well. And this is all really important because ultimately cheap energy prices is what really is going to replace natural gas and coal on the grid. Well, it's also kind of be the the driving force behind a lot of the technologies that we're we're investing in, right? Like even to create, you know, green hydrogen, we need cheap renewable electricity to split, you know, carbon into carbon negative feedstocks or carbon negative, you know, cement. It's all going to be electrified. So the question that comes up to me on this, right, is we've seen and what is shown here massive market adoption, right? Like the, a proliferation of renewables. We've seen the price drop. Energy prices are still rising. Let's talk through this. Why are energy prices still rising if we're, you know, getting cheaper power and we're getting more of the cheaper stuff too? Yeah. I mean, a lot of it is due to kind of the the broader, you know, global macro environment today, you know, the, the supply chain shortages from COVID, the Russia-Ukraine conflicts, all of it has kind of converged into the perfect storm. And hopefully it's a, it's a temporary blip. 
but that has kind of squeezed, you know, the the supply um, or just broader, you know, renewable deployment cycles, which would push up the the prices. So again, hopefully this is temporary, but. Yeah. No, th- this question actually stumped me the first time I got it. So I wanted to read up more on it. So where the prices have dropped a ton, there's still more room to drop here, right? So, I mean, coal is just so cheap to burn yeah. and to mine. And so replacing something that's that cheap, even if you're you're just marginally more expensive, you're actually going to be driving up costs as you reduce the use of a really cheap energy source to... Um, natural gas is also really cheap, but that, this is where we're kind of getting to those competitive levels with those um, non-renewable sources of energy or fossil fuel-based sources of energy. And then three, there is still, I guess, the intermittency side of renewable energy also requires um, backup power as well. And so right now you, you're adding one source of electricity but then you also have to, like many states, mandate a, a fossil fuel backup yeah. to those renewables as well. So you're actually doubling up there a little bit. And so you still have that extra capacity from the renewables, but then you have an added extra capacity to back up the renewables in form of usually natural gas. Um, and so that can help drive the prices on top of what you mentioned on the macroeconomic side as well. Mm-hmm. Is, but, this your, is this your plug to nuclear? No, I mean, there'll be plenty of plugs to nuclear, but I didn't plug it. I just wanted the records to show that Cedric brought up nuclear <laughs> there. <laughs> no, 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 I said natural gas backup. Maybe it'd be better to do a nuclear backup. I think the combination of a, a nuclear solution with or a combination nuclear solar versus uh, solar natural gas would be a, a great, you know, um, positive win for renewable energy um, as as nuclear could provide that baseload power. But another subject for another day. Well, maybe there will be some big, some other big nuclear news that we can uh, do a full episode on. Yeah, for sure. What what actually gives me hope and is, you know, a definitely uh, bright light in this report is this, this chart combined with um, one of the other tables in the IPCC report showing kind of the the multiple pathways and opportunities for scaling up, you know, climate mitigation opportunities. Uh, they break it out by energy supply, land, food, you know, building um, buildings and built infrastructure. And solar and winds uh, by far have, you know, the the biggest uh, carbon abatement potential. And so, you know, when you put that into context with these, you know, precipitously dropping prices, you know, hopefully they'll become close to free. I think we're in a good position there. Obviously a lot more work to be done, but it's looking, things are looking up. What I will say here on the IPCC report, this is great. It's great that there's a lot of coordination between different countries that we're putting all this data together and trying to make a you know combined and concerted effort um, to fixing climate change and making sure that the world is a better place for all those who come after us, right? Where the gap is, though, is that now the report's here. We see what could potentially happen, but who's going to do something about it, right? Who's going to put the money where their mouth is, <laughs> right? And go yeah. into market and actually fund these projects, take the risk, Um, found the companies that are going to be needed to make it um, or hit any of these goals that are outlined, right? Because the report's great. It's awesome. But if the report just gets thrown in the trash, then it's essentially meaningless. So that's where Fifth Wall, again, you know, really fits into this picture that we're we are 100% committed to attack these projects head on from the hardware to the software and everything in between um, to really make sure we make a meaningful and lasting impact on the world that we live in. One criticism that I will highlight, hot take for today though, is I was curious about the amount of language about carbon capture. Um, I think carbon capture, and I think Cedric would agree with me, is an awesome technology. It's very expensive still. Um, it's a little inefficient as well. It's part of the price, but maybe down the road could be an awesome solution. But as a near-term solution um, or recommendation that the report was kind of listing out, I kind of felt that it was maybe a little bit of a cop-out for the fossil fuel industry. Yeah. 
right? Because it's like, hey, like just keep burning fossil fuels. We'll just suck it out of the air with carbon capture and then we'll bury it deep into the ground. But we know that that's not really economically viable just yet. Like people are working on it, which is great. We encourage that. We'll probably invest around those areas as well to help push that technology forward. But it didn't seem like, it seemed like they were a little soft on the use of fossil fuels. It's kind of like, hey, we'll just have to keep using it and we'll just carbon capture capture everything. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel like that was kind of a little bit of a cop out there, right? Um, Because it's like, hey, doom and gloom, the world's going to come to an end. Like the world's going to be so terrible. But we'll just carbon we'll just carbon capture everything out, <laughs> and and that will reduce it enough. So that'd be my one criticism of the report. I think there are, you know, maybe some people that are lobbying around these governments yeah. <laughs> around the oil and gas sector would like to stay in business longer too. Yeah, I mean that's uh, one of the contentious points, right? In the the carbon capture debate um, is whether it's actually just you know a tool in the the oil and gas uh, tool belt for for them to essentially just keep keep doing business uh, without really truly decarbonizing. But I hear you on that. A conversation for another time. Definitely.